My name is Ernest Emerson, and I've been designing knives since 1979. Although I didn't start making knives uh, in earnest until after that, there were a couple knives I just made as, can I make knives or am I going to have fun making knives? Uh, and I'll tell you a little story. I was at a very well-known martial arts uh, school at the time. It's called the Filipino Cali Academy. and was run by a guy named Dan Inosanto and Richard Bastillo, who were the, the top instructors in the world of, in edge weapons and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, they were Bruce Lee's uh, best friends and protégés. And when I was at the school, uh, they introduced us to the butterfly knife, the Bally Song. And I was so poor at the time that I couldn't even afford to pay the dues at the school, which were $12.50 a month. Uh, and he'd say, well, Ernie, go in and clean up the bathroom and, you know, sweep up and, you know, wipe the mats down or whatever. And uh, so, I mean, I had no money. And they introduced us to these knives, and I absolutely fell in love with them but they were over $100 a piece. And so I looked at them and I said, do you think I could borrow one of your knives for the weekend? Because I think I could make one of those. So I took the knife home and uh, with a hand drill and a file and, and some pieces of aluminum and some nuts and bolts, I made my first knife, uh, which was a crude but workable bally song so I could learn how to manipulate it. And so actually that was the that was the genesis and the starting point for me making knives. I came from northern Wisconsin. I was raised uh, basically about as far north as you can go in the United States uh, without running into Canada. And I grew up on a, basically a dairy farm. I mean, I was born and raised in a log cabin that was built by my grandfather. And it was 20 feet by 30 feet. And I slept in the kitchen on a little bed uh, because there wasn't any other room in the, in the house for me. So it, it was a... Uh, it was a bare bones kind of life. I mean, I, I never felt like I wanted for anything because uh, there was a lot of love and there was always food and there was a lot of work. Uh, but I, I kind of think I had the idyllic uh, childhood growing up like that. I got involved in martial arts uh, basically like a lot of other young martial artists in my day, which was the Bruce Lee movies and the TV show Kung Fu. And I mean, I remember every Thursday night at 8 o'clock, I was glued to the television. Living in northern Wisconsin, there was no martial arts studios or schools or anything. Uh, I would drive 80 miles one way to Duluth, Minnesota, to the YMCA uh, twice a week to take a class there that was Korean Judo, because that was the only thing that existed within driving distance of where I lived. And I just always felt that that was my home, was on the mat or in the ring or, or against an opponent. It never was a hobby. That's not what I was all about. This was something I, the way I lived, and so it wasn't a, a hobby, it was a way of life. Has it influenced my knife making? 100%. Uh, a lot of the philosophies that I learned, uh, efficiency of action, economy of motion, uh, never do anything that's useless, uh, always do everything uh, with a purpose. Uh, it translates directly to my knives. My decision was, I'm going to make weapons. Uh, I want to work with the military, I want to work with law enforcement, and, you know, other people also. I mean, a, a knife is a knife, don't get me wrong, but they're, in my philosophy, in the way that I designed them, they're first and foremost a weapon. And I remember some of the other knife companies at the time saying, oh, Ernie, you know, you got to be real careful because of all the, the political correctness and all that. And I said, you know what, there's only one reason I want to make knives, I want to make weapons, so my knife company is going to be tactical, uh, weapon-making knife company. The thing that initially got me into a serious look at making knives was I went to a gun show in Pomona, California, and my wife and I went and uh, we were wandering around and we walked into this one uh, kind of a area and it was the knife making area. And I walked up and I was like, oh my God, I can't believe, I can't believe the craftsmanship and the level of expertise. And I looked at my wife and I said, Mary, I want to make, make knives. I started uh, buying some equipment to outfit a, a hobby shop in my garage and, and I soon realized that uh, I picked a hobby that could actually pay for itself. 
because I started building some knives and went to a couple of little local shows and people actually said, hey, I'd like to buy that. And I was like, holy smokes, this is cooler than cool because I'm having fun doing this and I'm actually, somebody's handing me dollar bills. What happened was at one of the local shows in Southern California, uh, three guys came up to my table and they identified themselves as uh, underwater welders. And they said, we, we'd like to know if you want to make some knives for us. And, and I said, are you kidding? Sure, that'd be, that'd be fun. About six to nine months had gone by and uh, one of the guys stepped up and he said, hey Ernie, you know, we haven't been real honest with you about who we are and what we do. <laughs> uh, we're not really underwater welders, we're, we're from SEAL Team 6. In all honesty, they were, they were my harshest critics. Uh, if it didn't work, they were like, Ernie, this is bullshit. Um, but they were my greatest supporters because what they did is they forced me to evolve as a designer and a builder. Uh, when your life depends on the tools, they have to be the, a tool your life can depend on. That's, that's a fact. And so it forced me to revisit the way that I looked at designing knives. And nothing from that point uh, was made to be pretty. It was made to be functional. One of the most unique things about the Emerson knives, of course, is the wave feature. Uh, I was working with a uh, group uh, out of Coronado and they, he got a hold of me and he said, Ernie, we wanted to have a knife that has some type of a blade catcher, if you will, on top of the uh, uh, blade so that if it ever was a knife on knife uh, situation and the knife from the bad guy glanced uh, and slid up the back of that blade, it wouldn't carry up across the guy's arm or cut his thumb off, that there'd be something there that would hook it and stop that blade. So uh, I designed a knife and put a hook on it on the top, strictly as a little hook that would catch a blade if it slid up the top of the, of the knife. And so I gave them the prototypes, I kept one myself, and we had some beers and we're talking about a bunch of stuff, and they said, Ernie, we'll, we'll, we'll talk to you later, we're gonna go down and test these out. I was fiddling around in the garage and I had the knife in my pocket and I went to pull it out and the blade partially opened. And I thought, oh, hmm, that's interesting, that hook catches on your pocket. Put it back in, pulled it out with a little bit of horsepower behind it, and bam, the blade opened right up. And I was like, holy sh holy heck, that hook opens the, the knife up as you deploy it out of your pocket. And, and I am not kidding, at that moment, my phone rang. And it was Mike Ferguson, he had, they had just gotten down to Coronado, they were fiddling around with the knives. He goes, Ernie, he goes, blankety blank, damn it. He goes, do you, do you know what this knife does when you pull it out of your pocket? It self deploys, for God's sake. He goes, it's, it's faster than a switchblade. He goes, this is, this is effing genius. And I said, Mike, I said, I just discovered it myself. I said, yeah, it does. And so thus was born the, the wave opening feature. Uh, and I'd like to tell you that I was some kind of design genius. It was by accident, uh, which I think maybe a lot of things are discovered by accident. But uh, that became a standard thing with all the knives that I was making for the teams at the time, which then filtered its way down into, now it's on every single Emerson design that we make. When I design a, a knife, I look at it also as, this has to stand the test of time. This isn't a trend, I'm not making a knife with a doohickey or a special wazoo on it because that's what's in right now. I'm making a knife so that I know that when you buy it from me, you can give that to your grandson and he'll still be able to say, this is a, this is a ass kicking knife because it will stand the test of time. And so the future of Emerson Knives will basically be still the influence of Ernest Emerson uh, even though I may not be around to run it. Or my, my wife, about once a week, she says, are we ever going to retire? And I said, honey, I don't know what retirement is because, you know, somebody told me one time, if, if you find a job that you love doing, you'll never work another day in your life. And uh, I'm going to work until the day I die. I guarantee you. And I got to tell you, um, if it wasn't for my wife, Mary, uh, who's really the brains of the outfit, I'm the government mule, uh, we wouldn't have this company. She has held it together through thick and thin. She has held it together when we maxed out 
every single credit card we had just to make payroll. Uh, I spent every cent of my uh, retirement when we decided to start this knife company. So, you know, I want to be sure that everybody understands this, the knife company just isn't Ernest Emerson. I designed the knives, but my, my wife, Mary, uh, is the real reason that this knife company exists because if it hadn't been for her, uh, we wouldn't have this knife company. So I owe it to my family, I owe it to her to do everything the best that I can possibly do to honor that kind of commitment from the people that I love.